the Trade, a series where we talk about the tools used in high seas piracy as it relates to blood and plunder. I'm Dan. And I'm Guy. And today we're talking about swords, pikes, and boarding axes. Three weapons with non-moving parts that are as ancient as maritime warfare gets. We had originally planned to do pistols in this segment because they're all on board a ship, but in the next video, we're going to just group it in. Group it in. We're going to do pistols, blunderbusses, and explosives. So there's a sneak peek, and stay tuned for that. But first, we'll get into probably the most ubiquitous pirate weapon, the sword. There's lots of swords that exist in the period. I'm sure, guys, you know as well. We have cutlasses. we got cavalry sabers. We have court swords or small swords. Rapiers were still around, but mostly in the hands of the Spanish. And you want to take a guess at which one was probably the best suited for a ship? The cutlass. Now, you'll see in a lot of media, you're correct, by the way, <laughs> that in a lot of media, you'll see like in the original Peter Pan, Captain Hook has a rapier. And in a lot of older pirate movies, they're fighting with rapiers on decks. The reason why that was done is because you could train a lot of actors to do classical theater fencing, and rapiers are safe to use because you're not very close. You're a little bit of ways, and you're doing more wrist-fancy movements. The problem is if you take that and apply it to an actual ship battle, a rapier, or even a small sword, even though it's shorter, but the techniques used require room to maneuver. And what isn't there a lot of on a ship when you're fighting, guy? Room to maneuver. Yeah. So while you could be a badass on the streets of Italy, you know, twiddling your rapier around and exchanging quips and going in for lunges and reposts and awesome parries, on a ship, that doesn't quite work. So while few Spaniards did carry rapiers on ships, they were pretty much close to useless. You do not want to use a rapier on a ship. And while a case can be made for the small sword, because it is smaller, it is more of a triangle-shaped blade or double-edged blade, depending on country and make and manufacture while it is shorter and lighter you still need room to get in for thrusts and when you get into combat all that fancy keeping the blade aligned with your arm keeping the tip toward your opponent that kind of goes out the window when people are swinging and yelling and swearing and there's grenades and guns going off so clearly those are poor choices would you agree they are very much poor choices which brings us into our old friend the cavalry saber while, again, we don't have sources that say, oh, they were used on ships, they did exist in the period, and some movies and some media show sabers on ships because, again, you can train actors to do somewhat theater combat with them because the blades are very long, usually about three foot, which means that it's safer to use. The problem is when you're on a ship, we keep talking about room, and a three-foot-long blade swinging around is bound to get caught in not only people, but ropes, masts, Anything that a sword can get caught on, a cavalry saber will do on a ship. While in theory, it sounds awesome, not so much. So, this brings us to my favorite blade of all time, and I will try not to fangirl too loud, the cutlass. The beauty of a cutlass is that you basically take the same manufacturing process as a cavalry saber, make it shorter, and make it dummy thick. The spine on these swords were very, very thick for the time, and they often weighed as much as a cavalry saber does. However, because they were shorter, they were much easier to use on board a ship. So instead of, you know, getting caught or anything like that, generally not going to happen. And because these swords are so heavy, it makes cutting people who usually aren't wearing armor very easy and almost an afterthought. Most cutlasses of the time were single-edged, there is a bit of a difference I'll get into in a minute, but they're generally single edge, still had a point for thrusting, and when we get into the Buccaneer era, they were more machete-esque blades. While, yes, they were meant to be used on a ship, they were often used for cutting brush. So if you, get, if you, as Henry Morgan, get off to go and do not nice things to Panama, you're carrying a cutlass that looks more like a machete with a D-guard on it which is effective, you know, I'm not discounting it at all, but it's very different from the sword that someone like Calico Jack or Blackbeard would have carried in the early 1700s. By the time we get into that, weapons are getting more fancy, and these were often, while still thick in the spine of the blade, they were not as thick, not as wide, sorry, from the spine to the edge, but they were still very, very 
focused on the cut and had more embellished handguard designs. You could say, as a fellow nerd, that it is a elegant weapon for a more civilized age. <laughs> and again, these blades were meant for ship combat specifically. But the good thing about them is if you get off the ship and you're in Panama, they are so heavy that people with spears, people with, you know, axes or more improvised heavy weapons or muskets, because of the weight of the cut list, you can actually parry that off with very little difficulty if you know what you're doing. Which is something, again, the small sword really sucks at because it's so light and quick, but when you, someone is swinging a musket butt at you, you're not going to be parrying or shrugging that off anytime soon. Your small sword is going to go flying across the field, and when you turn back, there's going to be about five dudes beating you to death with musket butts. Not a good time. Yeah, the cutlass, like, when I've used mine, it uh, feels like an axe. Um, it will, I've even used it to cut down a tree before. Uh, a thin tree, granted, but it, it, it feels like an axe when you use it. Yeah, we'll try to run a picture. My personal cut list that I had made and modified for my personal use is basically one that Blackbeard would have would have carried. It's got a really it's not really fancy, but it's got a beautiful D guard for all that hand protection because again, when you're on a ship, if you don't have hand protection, it's really easy for someone to purposefully or accidentally hit your knuckles, hit your hand with literally anything, and you drop your sword, and before you can pick that up, you're gonna get run through. It's not like the movies where you'll see, you know, very long, drawn-out sword fights. Cutlass fighting was very quick, and it's very brutal. That's why we don't see a lot of it accurately represented in media, because it's dangerous for actors to do. A cutlass fight is two people coming at full speed. There's going to be maybe one block or a miss, and someone running someone through or lopping a limb off, shoving them aside, and keep going. It is quick, it is deadly, and it is not pretty or fancy. If you want a modern day example, look up machete fights. Yes, exactly. Anything along those lines. That's a perfect representation. So now that we've finished with swords, I'm going to hand the torch to you, Guy, and let you talk about boarding pikes. Boarding pikes. Boarding pikes are one of the weapons on uh, one of my personal favorite Spanish units, the Marineros Piqueros. And they have a long, elaborate history with. Uh, people on ships and uh, and using them. Uh, people have been using spears on ships for as long as they have been fighting on ships because a spear on a ship, when you're not using bows or anything like that, it's really the the longest you can get. And traditionally, boarding pikes or, or spears have been a uh, defensive weapon on a ship to repel boarders. Because the last thing a group of people trying to jump onto another ship want is a wall of of spears and 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 pikes facing their way. But uh, boarding pikes in the age of sail kind of have a unique history where, in one part, they are are knowledgeable weapons used by by sailors, like I said, to repel boarding. But they also had a practical use on the ship too, where the uh, pike would have a uh, usually it would be a, the ones on ships would be a little bit sh shorter than regular pikes, where a regular pike would be 12 to 13 feet long. A boarding pike is only 8 to 9 feet long, so a little bit shorter. And instead of having a usual pike on for land, would have a uh, cross guard at the end to protect uh the again the fingers of the wielder from having a weapon run down the length of the pike but on a ship like uh you were talking dan with the uh uh things getting getting tangled up in the rigging they wouldn't put a cross guard on boarding pikes because they didn't want to have it snag in the rigging or anything so it would just be a a blade that would usually be two to three inches long uh, uh, with a long, uh, sh with a long uh, connecting segment that would usually be um, braced, and then it would also usually have a uh, hook on the underside of it. Of course, that hook fell out of favor as time went on, but initially that was used as the practical uh, aspect of the boarding pike, which which would be to use it to pull things that are near the ship closer to it. So they would use that to pull, like, the dock um, or to the pier, uh, pull uh, things out of the water. Sometimes there's, there's the idea that they would also use it to pull other ships uh, close to them 
for boarding. It was also there, that hook was also there because as a strategy in fighting, you could you could thrust with the pike. And then also, as you're thrusting, move the pike down, so into the enemy, and pull it back. And so in the, in the returning it, it would also have a chance of uh, injuring somebody with that sharp hook. So imagine you're fighting a pike, you think it missed because it went too high, and then it gets dragged in and the, the hook bites into your shoulder, pulling you forward into the water. So that's, that's what that hook is there for, uh, for fighting. And uh, the kind of the usual thing that w- we don't really see in, in Blood and Plunder is that your Marineros, Piqueros, uh, or any other unit that has a boarding pike, the pikes on the ship were actually stored in a, uh, in a butt or a, a barrel that was next to the mast or around the mast as a collar. So, so they were there for when the ship was boarded, need to repel boarders, or they need to use the pikes offensively. The people on that deck could turn around and grab the pike. Alternatively, before a boarding action or something like that, a quartermaster might hand out pikes and be be responsible for them and start handing them out to everybody before uh, to repel borders or to do a boarding action. So we've seen there's both of those things happened in history. You mentioned that hook. I can only imagine if it doesn't bite your shoulder, if it gets caught in just, you know, your clothes, catch your weapon, it's going to, if it doesn't pull you off the ship, it's pulling something off you. Yeah. It's pulling you to the floor. That does not sound like a good time. It is, it is meant to hurt you. On, on land, that's what the, the larger, on a pike, that's what the larger, the, the kind of the triangle blade of the pikes they would use in the pike and shot air would look like because no they would usually have a bladed tip and then they would have this little triangle axe that came down from it and it served the same point as the uh pike i mean uh pike hook where on the return of the weapon on pulling it back it would be meant to be pushed down and try cutting somebody while you're pulling it back i did not know that that's very interesting well eventually in the in the late 18th century they started removing the hook because they would keep long uh long pikes on board that were not defensive weapons because they the hook would like we were talking about getting tangled up in rigging is is a concern and that hook would make it so sometimes they would get tangled up in rigging so they would eventually and it was also it's a a finicky part that you're putting on a simple weapon. So in the late uh, 18th century, they would remove pikes completely for military use or n- remove the hook on the pike. And that was also uh, where they would, with militaries, they would actually train and drill with using the pike uh, as a as a spear wall on a ship. It's kind of a, intimidating if you think about it, but... It's kind of, but that's where the defensive fire, defensive attack with range weapon like lances and blend planner comes from is that that military dr- training for making a spear wall. Again, a spear wall going back even to the to the um, the Greeks and, <laughs> and everything yeah. else, but using it on a modern ship to defend borders uh, where they would have the the row in the front would uh would brace it against their hip at a low angle and then the ones in the back would be holding it above their head pointed down so as the as the first row tries finding a shot the ones in the back can reach over and stab from above uh it's it's a uh, a terrifying when you think about that and having having a sword and trying to to rush into a line of spears like that on the opposing ship yeah, I can imagine. You're exhausted already. You're boarding a ship. You hopped over. Maybe you didn't catch the ladder and you fell and you caught a, you know, one of the gun ports. You're crawling up. You finally get on the ship. You take a big old breath. You draw your cutlass and you see spears. Yep. Nothing but nothing but a line of, of spears. That's, again, one of my favorite Spanish units is the Marineros Piqueros because no one wants to board a pokey boat. <laughs> It's yeah, sad. no, Pokeboat's bad. 
that line of spears right there. And even in even in the air of of bayonets, uh, the the boarding pikes were still used. Again, boarding pikes would only be replaced as a to repel borders by repeating firearms. That's the only thing that unseated them. And that brings us to our next item, though, the most, I think, interesting of the boarding weapons. That would be the boarding axe. I'm going to apologize up front. I'm going to probably pop a lot of bubbles here, and it's not as cool as I'd like it to be, but it does bear mention here. Boarding axes were equipped on ships. They weren't really intended in their inception to be a frontline weapon. It was more to, you know, cut rope, essentially, cut wood. Anything that needed to be cut in a jiffy, you know, if your mast falls and it's dragging you down, you got a bunch of people with axes to cut the ropes and, you know, get rid of that mast so it doesn't drag your whole ship down. Cut so, the boarding lines, too. That That's what I thought the, one of their primary uses for was uh, when you're being boarded, cut the lines of the that they're using to board you. Yep, that'll, that'll, I was about to get into that. That is, yes. In fact, that's exactly what I was going to say. That is exactly. <laughs> so they are typically real short, maybe a foot, if that, maybe a foot and a half with, you know, the earlier models had just, you know, a kind of a steel hatchet blade. Later, later models would have a little spike on the back. And while it might look like, you know, sweet, it's an axe. There is a big problem, and that is reach. Your cutlass blade is going to be probably 24, 26 inches, so just just that or just over two feet long, and that's just blade. And you got something about half that half that range with no real hand protection other than holding it right under the axe blade. And you have to get really close. And while, yes, you're on a ship, you can't get close, you have to navigate somebody else's blade to land a blow with that boarding axe. I'm not saying it wasn't done. It was probably done. I mean, if you're knocked over and there's an axe on by, some guy's wailing on you, if you can run over, grab that axe, and brain him, you're good. You got rid of him. But it's definitely not ideal. I definitely wouldn't want to stare down a guy with the cutlass with a boarding axe or two. Now, also, though, one of the primary uses of the boarding axe, it, it's as not as a weapon, but the boarding axe is used to cut wood. So one of the things that happened in the Age of Sail, in the, the Blood and Plunder era, in the Age of Buccaneers, is ships had layers. They had whole compartments underneath the deck that if you're boarding, you're going to have to go into those areas. And that's where you have you run into a lot of the problems that a pirate would have is, hey, somebody is hiding behind a locked door. And that's where a boarding axe is really handy, is if you need to cut through that door, if you need to cut through that porthole, if you need to cut, you know, into that cabin, even through the roof, if there's a if there's a grate up there to get into there and and get them out. You know, that's something that a cut that a cutlass will do, like I was talking about. I've used it to cut wood before, but a boarding axe is tailor made on a ship with its thin blade and uh, its uh, back spike, it is made there, it is made to pry and to cut. So is it a weapon? Meh, but it's definitely a tool, which is why we're including it here. However, I will say that some of my favorite models from Blood and Plunder, I think it's the um, the Sea Dogs, where they got the shirtless guy with the boarding axe. Mm-hmm. He looks awesome. And... I would love to see someone make an entire boarding crew of just that one model. Oh, that would be great. Yeah. Well, and and like though the uh, like what I was talking about with the boarding pikes, uh, boarding axes were not a a personal hand weapon though. Too, boarding axes were stored on the gun walls of ships, usually near the cannons on a little rack on there because they were all uh, you know. It's it's about functionality. If there's if something's on fire and you need to cut it out, you need an axe at hand to cut the ropes off that thing. Yeah, that that would be really handy. <laughs> yeah. So a little fun thing we'll do here. So we covered swords, pikes, and boring axes. I know on our on the main blood and pigment article we rate things. Since we do with multiple weapons now, let's give our personal our personal best, I guess, on what we would rate these weapons. Oh, if man. I'm on a ship. And I know that, you know, I'm about to board. 
I think I would rate the Cutlass first. While I think the Boarding Pike is awesome, I expect to be in really tight quarters, and I would rather carry a Cutlass on me, assuming I didn't have a pistol or a firearm at hand. So my rank would be definitely the Cutlass, the Boarding Pike next, because that's still an actual you know, weapon, and I could do some damage with that in a more defensive role. Wouldn't be my first choice, but still better than the boarding axe. I don't care if I have, you know, a bandolier full of them and I'm just yeeting them in every direction. <laughs> I really, I, my biggest thing for me as a martial artist and someone who practices with stuff like this, I really like hand protection. And there is no hand protection with the boarding axe. There's no, you can choke up on the blade, but then you're still, there's just no good way. I don't like hand, I don't like not being within reach and I don't like not having hand protection. I my instructor is a guy who likes to snipe hands. So mm-hmm. how do you how do you counter that? A nice fat piece of hand protection. <laughs> what about you, guy? What, how would you rate these? I have to agree with your your list. Uh, I would put uh, boarding bikes above swords, just because if you're attacking an enemy ship with a pike and you have a unit, you have a group of of trained people that know how to board using pikes. Each of them have has like you have to understand each of those people that has a pike has a sword at their hip too. Like it's it's a board it's a weapon they have. But I would rate pikes above swords because swords are also one of the best defensive weapons. It's the only defensive weapon from what we listed. You can try blocking a shot at you with a pike, but you're you're not going to because of no no room to maneuver on a ship mm-hmm. and and even if you're blocking that that hit with the shaft those cutlasses are made to cut through things and it's not it's not going to your pike is not going to last a long time against somebody that really wants to hurt you with a cutlass yeah yeah so uh and then and the other thing about that we have that I have to think about is all three of these have you know, on a on a ship that's that's it is there as a well oiled machine. Swords are defensive, pikes are really a tool, and boarding axes are a tool as well. So I would go pikes, swords, and then an axe. I can vibe with that. Maybe it's just my inner fanboyish love of the cutlass that blinds me to the way of the pike. But that's just that's my thing. I love I love my cutlass. My cutlass cut 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 a coconut. Straight through. <laughs> I love it. It's amazing. Threw up in nice. the air, went, okay, let's see how this goes. Went straight through, and I went, oh, what? what? <laughs> <laughs> Pleasantly surprised. That is awesome. Oh, really quick, some weird examples of hand weapons I had written down, but I forgot yeah. that I put them in my other thing. So there are replicas, and you will see people out there with things like, you know, small daggers with pistols built into them, or knives in general. They definitely had a place but they weren't, that was something that was typically brought on, not given. Mm -hmm. So that will, if we choose to go into the really weird stuff, we can do that in another video. But just because some, I can imagine somebody's going to go, Oi, you forgot about me knife. And I'm going to say, well, that was more of a personal thing. If someone brought like a really nice fighting knife, that was usually a personal possession. They brought on board or got in port or something. We're talking about the stuff that was available to pretty much everybody on board. Yeah, and and with a person on a ship, uh, in the air, a knife was a tool more than a weapon. You used your knife every day to eat because there were no utensils, there were no forks, there were no common knives. If, you, if there was food there that needed to be cut, you had your own knife that you would use to eat it. Uh, and then if you needed to cut something yourself, you used your own knife. And you were expected to keep your knife looking nice even if it was a cheap one because it was a everyday you uh tool now it was also a, a weapon of convenience because if you were drunk and you got in a fight with somebody and you really thought they needed to start breathing through their neck you had a knife right there to make that happen yeah, and even even in a scrap if you know you're close up and you know let's say let's give an example you got a guy and you're in a bind and you have a pike and you know he's got you backed up in a corner got you trapped I'm going to bet you got a knife on you somewhere that he's not going to see. You can pull out and make some swift cuts and make him drop that naughty cutlass. I mean, it definitely has a place. It happened in history. Both swords and pikes can bind an opponent's blade. 
uh, using leverage against it. And then if you're doing that and you can pull your knife and jab them in the ribs really quick, that's a good way to win a fight. You could always, you know, kick the groin, but that's for another time. <laughs> <laughs> that's for another time. That's that's Dan's style right there. If there's a groin, I'm going to kick it. <laughs> a man will get up if he's if you've kicked his balls. He will not get up if you've cut his liver. It's it's the it's the it's the the, the pregame. You kick him across, and <laughs> he falls over. Then you finish him, and you go, "Okay, that was really stressful. Let's rinse and continue." Um, <laughs> I'm thinking of the uh, season, the first episode of Black Sails. If y'all haven't watched it, go watch it. It's amazing when he's fighting without spoilers. That the one big bald guy, and he's got him in a bind up against the pole. What does he do? He knees him in the crotch. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Perfect. It, it works. A weapon of convenience. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we'll get into we have plans for, you know, covering the weapons of the natives and those get really cool really quick. And if we have if we get enough material, we'll do one of all like the really weird far fetched examples, you know, of weapons you might have seen on board a ship. But for right now, this is just all the stuff that, you know, was commonplace and you're gonna find swords, b- boarding pikes, and boarding axes pretty much on every ship that you win. Every ship that was meant to fight, at least. And every game of Blood and Plunder you play will have one of these weapons on the table. For more Blood and Plunder articles and content, you can watch our YouTube channel, and also go over to bloodandpigment.com and check out the articles we have there. We got articles on ships, nations, factions, terrain building, painting guides, battle reports, so go check it out. This has been Tools of the Trade with your hosts, Dan and Guy. Keep your dice at the ready and the wind at your back. Yarrr!